Hello and welcome everyone. This is Waking Up in Daily Life, conversations on creativity, consciousness, and community. I'm your host, Albert Flynn De Silver, and I want to thank you all so much for listening and for tuning in. And just a quick reminder before we get started today to go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel just by clicking that little subscribe button and um, your shares are most welcome. Uh, these conversations come to you uh, totally free. We don't have any sponsors or supporters. So uh, the more that you can share these great conversations, that really helps us out. So thanks for that. And uh, today I am super excited to welcome Marion Roach Smith, who is the author of The Memoir Project, a thoroughly non-standardized text for writing and life. Um, this is a new edition, revised and updated, uh, which I absolutely loved reading. And um, you are also the author of uh, a couple of other books that um, I would love for you to, to tell us about as a way to get started. Oh, that's lovely of you. Well, it's wonderful to be here. I'm such a fan of yours and so admire the way you bring writing to people and the, the generosity that you provide to writers. So thank you from all of us for that. And I started my writing career. I, I went from, from college straight to the New York Times and ended up writing a piece when I was very young for the New York Times Magazine about Alzheimer's disease, which um, no one had ever written about before. It doesn't seem possible. You would think everyone has always known about it, but I was able to help introduce the subject with a piece. My, my mom was 49 when she got sick. I was oh in my, my 20s. And what and year was this? That was 1983. And wow, it was the wow. first time anyone had ever written about it in the first person. And so it had a huge effect. I ended up on the Today Show the next day and all kinds of things happened to me. But my first book came out of that piece, which was an expansion of the magazine piece for Houghton Mifflin called Another Name for Madness. And mm. that was a big experience for me as a young writer. I had no idea when I wrote that magazine piece that I was going to end up on the Today Show or with a book contract or with an agent or it's a dream. It. Looking back, it's a dream come true. At the time, it was just, it was dear in the headlights time, but it sure. can happen. And I need, and I always want to say that to writers that if you have a well placed magazine piece, you can get a book contract, you can get an agent, you can get on the Today Show. So it does yes. happen. It does happen. happen I have a, a, a dear friend, Laura Munson, that mm -hmm. happened to, she wrote the piece for the Modern Love column. And yes. um, got a book deal and a great agent, which I think actually you two might share. Um, it's very yeah. possible. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> um, but so let's go back a little bit to the beginning. Um, I don't know that much about your history, so it'd be fun to hear. And um, But I did read that your father was a writer. Is that correct? Yes, my father was a sports writer. My mother was a journalist. My sister's a journalist. My husband's a journalist. <laughs> it's an illness. So. <laughs> it's a sickness. And yeah. when I was raised, with all my parents' friends were writers. And it was really a wondrous thing. What I learned very early on is the command that you can have if you're a storyteller and that there is nothing more wonderful than making people laugh. So I was mm -hmm. goggle-eyed as a kid as my parents' friends swapped stories around the dinner table and my house was filled with books and I'm a very, and it's a, I think it's the greatest privilege in the world. And there was a library nearby and we were always encouraged to read. But yes, my dad was a sports writer, which is about as fun as it gets. Um, yeah. to have a sports writer dad and he had a way with words that was unique to him he loved language and it helped us both my sister and me to grow up with a great aspiration to be writers yeah that's beautiful we're going to come back to him at the end because i i want to close with a, a I want to close on the topic of poignancy oh. and um, so we'll come full circle <laughs> to that, but I love this. So you were really immersed. Like this was, it wasn't like you were going to go to nursing school. <laughs> it's like you basically probably had not. to become probably um, not or, it's, you know, yeah. go into corporate America or, you know, run the, um, you know, whatever. Well, it was, a, it was an ethic of that language. And I remember my mother taught me to read when I was very young and that power that a word becomes a sentence and a sentence becomes an idea and an idea becomes power was very easily translated in my family because people were very literate and they were very happy to be telling stories. 
And that's a wonderful thing to be also then very available to other people's stories, which I think is 99% of writing is, is reading, of course. You've got to read well to write well and also listen to other people's tales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so true. I mean, I, I, that my parents were not writers, but they were epic readers. Mm -hmm. And my mother was an incredible storyteller and always the life of the party. So that piece of it, I love how you said that, how important that is listening to other people's stories. And, mm -hmm. um, it must have gotten into me. <laughs> <That way. laughs> Apparently. <Right? laughs> um, well, so, um, I kind of want to jump in, um, I, I'm speaking of stories, um, there's an acknowledgement. I love reading <laughs> the acknowledgement. I do too. I love those books. Yeah. And there's a very intriguing note uh, in the in the memoir project that said something to the effect of, um, thank you, Paul Ehrman, if I'm pronouncing his name properly, whose poetry career was destroyed along the way <laughs> to his success as an essayist. <laughs> so can you oh. tell that story? <laughs> <laughs> Paul Eamon was a student of mine for a long time, and he came into the class kicking and screaming. He didn't know why he had been dropped there. That happened a lot. People gave it as gifts when I was teaching in, in person mm -hmm. in upstate New York at an art center. And he was a beautiful poet. He is a beautiful poet. Mm -hmm. Small, very angular, extremely um, precise about the pain of living through abuse. Mm. and wanted to be a poet, was a poet, didn't want this memoir stuff. And I said to him, I, I think I think the course was given to him as a gift. And he was in the class for about eight years. I mean, he just kept coming back and back oh, because wow. he got community, okay. which I don't believe he'd ever had in his family. Writing was not something that they did. His poetry was kind of his secret. Mm. And yet he got himself through recovery from a lot of life experiences with his poetry. And uh, we turned him into an essayist and he ended up getting published and well published. He got oh, in one right. of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and many other pieces. And mm. um, that's so wonderful that you saw that. He'll be so thrilled. I'll make sure to tell him to watch this. So he, we turned him into an essayist and he's never forgiven me. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. That's totally brilliant. Well, and I think it, it's important, you know, I one of the things um, I find it interesting that there's some writers who's, who stay totally in their genre, mm. you know, and, and then there's others who, you know, you know, like myself, uh, I just, I can't stay put, you know, I wrote poetry almost exclusively for 12 or 13 years. And then this memoir thing, just the story wouldn't <laughs> leave me alone. You know, it right. was kind of haunting me. Mm -hmm. And then you read, you know, someone like Mary Carr and you're just like, what <laughs> you know like this is amazing like the vulnerability and the truth telling and the poetry yeah um and so it was I just felt like well I don't know how to write a sentence but let's give it a whirl you know because <laughs> you're Good. not writing right so um Good. yeah I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about like in your experience uh as both a writer and um uh because you've you've written memoirs you've written nonfiction. I don't know if you've written poetry um, and other things that you've written and how important or not important is that to, to write in other genres? Well, when I was first growing up as a writer in, in my first book, um, I was told to stick to a lane, right? Choose mm -hmm. a lane and stick to it. Mm -hmm. And if you're a nonfiction writer, you're a nonfiction writer. So I got tagged pretty early as a nonfiction writer. And I went on to write two other nonfiction books, one after spending two years behind the scenes in the world of forensic science, which was an amazing experience. It's called mm -hmm. Dead Reckoning. It was published by Simon and Schuster, mm -hmm. and I did get to go to blood spatter analysis school and and uh, autopsy. Wait, 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 wait! <laughs> blood spatter analysis school. Yes, That's it's very thing. handy. Uh, yes, it's a thing because people who testify in court must be certified within the science with which they're going to in within which they're going to testify. So I got into these schools that no one's allowed to go to because I, I had a good connection. Co-wrote the book with the world's leading forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Bodden. And he got me entry into these remarkable things. So I went for a week to blood spatter analysis school and studied <laughs> the elliptical trigonometry of blood when it spatters. And those kinds of experiences, and, and the next book I wrote was on the history of red hair, which is, is all about genetic 
migration and population and and the why we hate each other based on how we look and mm. and bias and all of these things those are not straight nonfiction books and mm -hmm. yet they both had a piece of memoir in them yeah. and what i learned um was that sticking to that lane was just not what was cut out for me that mm. i i love nonfiction reporting i liked being a journalist but i had grown up writing poetry i've been writing poetry since i was a very little girl and my greatest influence, writing influence, is Emily Dickinson. And yes, I, yes, yes. I am a huge Emily fan. And I love what the newest iteration of Emily is the closest thing to reality a woman with a sexual appetite, a woman who was not writing just to God, a woman who wasn't just this virginal recluse. This woman was one of our, was our maybe our second greatest or our greatest Civil War poet, an amazing person. And I read all the biographies and and studied her like a crazy person when I was a kid. I just love her. And yeah. she was an enormous influence on me about choosing individual words. Emily used to cut words out of magazines and put them next to each other and look at them. And she, when I read that the first time when I was about 15, I understood about propinquity, about language appearing on a page that has a look and a sound. Mm -hmm. And that even though the reader is reading quietly, they're hearing the internal rhyming, they're thinking about that that agitation that words can cause each other and that heightening effect that words can cause. And Emily is the greatest writing teacher in the world because if you study that language, which a lot of people find inscrutable, you get the friction of what she's getting at. And whether the subject be nature or war or God or death, you are changed. And you can change people with a few words, right? I mean, look at Lincoln. Uh, you know, yeah. of the people, by the people, for the people. Greatest phrase ever to describe <laughs> democracy, um, not long. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, and you have this brilliant quote uh, of Emily, uh, who I also, I bow down to Emily. Good, I'm, let's all uh, bow. Love reading, wow. I have many volumes of Emily. And uh, yeah, she's a total hero of yeah, mine. Good. Um, and you have a, a, a quote from one of the poems in here that's a, a great definition of memoir. And yeah. I'm wondering, can you share that and recite it sure. for us? <laughs> so it's it's the poem that begins, tell all the truth and tell it slant, success mm -hmm. in circuit lies. And it's a wonderful poem. I keep a picture of Emily on my desk. It's over there, but um, she overlooks everything I do. And I also go to her home regularly um, for, for the tour. And now, I don't know if you know this, but your writers should know this. You can rent her bedroom where she wrote for an hour and write. And <laughs> it is that. a studio session and it is life changing to be. And this is in Amherst? Amherst, Massachusetts. Yeah. The homestead, mm -hmm. it's called. It's just undergone the most astonishing refurbishing, getting it back to its original state. And um, yes, yeah, so you want to go and take a studio time at Emily in Emily's room. It's I do. And I happen to be going to Massachusetts <gasps> in July. So Make your appointment. Just get I on, just will. go on there. But okay. but you <laughs> but to that on. quote, I love that. Yes, the, the homestead. You'll see just the Emily Dickinson Museum. You can't miss it. Okay. It, that with that quote I thought I think is brilliant because you need to tell the truth from your slant, from your point of view. And success in circuit does lie, connecting the things. You know, writing is cumulative. I think the most important word I teach anyone, and I've taught thousands of people to write memoir, is the word cumulative. You've got mm. to build. You have to set it up in the beginning, show us what's at stake if it's a piece of memoir, and then build on that. And people forget that all the time. It means nothing to me if you open a piece of memoir with, I was born in 1975 and I have green eyes and brown hair. And yet right. that's pretty much, I don't mean literally, but that's pretty much the kind of information people try to start with. And it's not what we're interested in. You've got to build. So Emily teaches us a lot in that quote. And that she goes on to finish the poem with the, tu the truth must dazzle gradually. And look at that internal mm. rhyming. Oh, or yeah. every I be every I be blind, every man be blind. I'd have to look it up. But the truth must dazzle gradually is also the very best writing advice in the world. It don't mm -hmm. come on and just dump your story on us. Right. But dazzle me gradually, little mm -hmm. shards at a time. So I think she's about as good as it gets as a writing coach, a writing teacher, and a model. Yeah, yeah. Um, God, that's a such a great line. Dazzle me gradually. I yeah, mean, that's the, the title truth, of a book. The truth must dazzle <laughs> gradually. Yeah, she's she's damn good. <laughs> this is great. So, um, speaking of dazzling gradually, uh, 
I'm curious if there's any difference between writing a novel and writing a memoir from that structural point of view. So I don't write fiction, although I have, and I, I I wrote it and put it in a drawer, which was a great writing experience for me. And and I think that's something people need to know is sometimes you do write things and put them in a drawer. But my understanding from story structure is that there's a great similarity and that you must, the reader has to know what's at stake fairly soon. Mm -hmm. And in memoir, it's absolutely essential. Memoir is so easily and beautifully broken down into three acts, because if you set us up in the at first act, with what skills you have on you and what skills you lack and what's at stake. We know when you get to act two, when you show us what you have to learn and what you have to shed and what you have to do, why you have to do that. And we know what you're packing and we know mm. what you lack. And then in act three, all you have to do is show us what life is like after. So there's, I read an awful lot of novels. In fact, I tell people all the time, don't read memoir to write memoir, read, read really good literary fiction mm -hmm. and watch how people are moved around a room and how they speak and all that. But I do think there's a great, great similarity. I just would never try to speak outside of my area of expertise. My novelist friends, I suspect, think that there's a great difference or maybe they don't. I don't know. Um, but the structure of books is really, really important. And the memoir structure is will save your life if you learn how to get a good structure. Yeah. No, I, this is this is beautiful to hear because I think a lot of people do get stuck on that piece. Like, you know, they want to sort of tell, they don't, you know, they want to tell the whole story. Yeah. You know, from soup to nuts, from birth to death. Yeah. And that's that's not memoir as we know it in terms of contemporary memoir as a as a literary genre. No, it's um, not. And it's a book you'll never finish and no one's ever going to read. I right. teach everybody to write from one area of your expertise at a time. So you probably mm -hmm. have 12 of them. And I define those as what you know after something you've been through. Mm -hmm. So to get back to my mother, she was an Alzheimer's patient for 15 years. I wrote a book, co-wrote a book, wrote introduction to three other books, wrote five NPR essays, wrote countless blog posts, personal essays that I published all over the place all with her in the topic, but they were all about something different. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing you have to understand is that they weren't all telling the whole story. The area mm -hmm. of expertise there was one of caregiving. And mm -hmm. when I write about my dog, I've had 12 dogs in my life. I'm writing from my area of expertise of raising 12 dogs and knowing that dogs do things for people that people cannot do for themselves. And another area of expertise will be the 30 years of gardening I have, but I don't write mm. a gardening caregiving dog book because why? And if you start yeah. to split it up this way, you can have a writing life and not just write that one big book. And that's a much more fun place to live. Yeah. 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 Um, I uh, would also love to hear a little bit about um what you discovered, you know, you, you could say, oh, I wrote this book about um, Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. but there was, there was a really remarkable discovery, very dramatic discovery in that process. Would you be willing to share that story about sure. your mother? That's very, um, very kind of you to ask. So as I said, my mom was 49 when she got sick and I was 22. My father had just died. It was a terrible time. It was shocking um, and, and very frightening. What I didn't understand was how connected she and I were. And I didn't understand that until I read the first draft of my book. When I was contracted by Houghton Mifflin to write this book, first of all, no one was more surprised than I that anyone would want a book out of me. I was just a kid after all. Mm -hmm. And then I was lucky enough to end up with the single greatest editor of the 20th and early 21st century, Nan Talese at, at uh, Doubleday. Yes. Yeah. Um, at that time she was at Houghton Mifflin, sorry. She had just, she just retired from her own imprint. And Nan taught me to write books. And what Nan taught me was after I read that first draft, which she taught me to read aloud, touching every word with a pencil without changing it. Once I had my whole first draft, something I still do to this day everything with everything I read, can you say that one more time? Read the, you print out the whole first draft mm -hmm. and read it aloud to yourself, touching every single word with a pencil, but changing no words. And Brilliant. hear that people, hear that absolutely. from Nan Talese. This is There's amazing. There's a really good great. reason for it. And <clears throat> what happened to me after I read it was I realized that I was 
way too connected to my mother. Mm. And I don't think anyone else reading that draft would have seen that storyline, but I did. And you Mm. are supposed to learn as you write. And I learned that. And I learned that if I was to survive her as she intended me to do Mm. and live the life she raised me to live, I had to let her go. Mm. And then I also had a life task in front of me i went and got a lot of therapy (laughs) and second of all i had a a trope to sort of tell the story on which is you started rooting for a very flawed hero which is me Mm -hmm. and you start saying you gotta let her go you gotta Mm -hmm. let her go so when i do put her in a nursing home at 56 years old it's not that you're saying well good for you you're saying of course of course and that's Mm -hmm. part of the story so that's the beauty of memoir. We learn about ourselves. One of the many beauties of memoir. We learn about ourselves. But that was a big one for me. Yeah. Um, really beautiful. Totally amazing. And um, so I can we talk about the vomit draft? <laughs> Just the <laughs> definition. Uh, since we're sort of in that process yeah. zone. Um uh, yeah. Sorry, that's kind of an abrupt transition. But, no, it isn't. Um, <laughs> that's the first. It was with the vomit draft that I I went and I said, "My God, the story is, I need help. I'm so yeah. attached to her." Yeah. I, I mean, the the scene early in the book, I write a scene about watching her water ski when I'm a very little girl, yeah. and wanting to be her so badly mm. that she came back to the dock and put my sneakers on my feet, her sneakers over them, and then put my feet into those water ski pockets because nobody made water skis that small. I mean, I was like five, mm. and she understood that desire for me to emulate her so it was also a two-way street with us yeah. we were what a beautiful a- connected. anecdote is that is that in the book in the set in the book yes yeah yes. yeah that's and such once a i read one. and once i saw that scene again after i had read the first draft i understood that i had actually been the one to put it on the page that we were too connected um and that she did nothing to break that connection either it was going to get broken i was 22 but i wasn't wow. ready yet right wow yeah. So the vomit draft. So that all we we use. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, before that, I just wanted to say that I, I that was so important, like in, in reading the memoir project, you know, over and over, you come back to the importance of these little intimate anecdotes. Yeah. And I think it's easy as, for us, especially as new writers, to just sort of dismiss those things. It's like, oh, that's not that interesting you know, but no, that's it. That's like, that's it. That's gold. Those little anecdotes that nobody else's mom might've thought to do. That's very particular to your situation and your story. So, so powerful. I mean, just hearing you recount that it's like, it's that's just, what, you're absolutely right. That's where it lives. And people think that nothing much happened to them today. And I will tell you, you've got 25 or 30 personal essays that happened to you today, probably if you had been paying attention. <laughs> the joy you felt when you went outside and heard the birds as spring comes back, the joy that your dog brings you, you know, my dog usually brings me a gift every day. There's something from the garden. Sometimes I'm like, why did you dig that up? But, you know, <laughs> the, those experiences are where the real life lives. And, and the personal essay, for instance, which is a very wonderful tool. I always say to writers, again, don't just write that one big book. Learn how to write the personal essay. Learn how to write op-eds because you can have a writing life. But the personal essay is built from the small moments that illuminate the large moments of life. And while I will never write a book about how to be married, I've been married a very long time and have published thousands of words from my marriage of the small moments that illuminate the large theme of going the distance with another human being in this life. Speaking of which, (laughs) this is a perfect segue. Will you uh, share that story about the sticker, the car sticker? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> with the n- numbers that's one of my favorite stories because I've poor... had the same thing I've been looking at these goddamn stickers with random numbers on them like what is this <laughs> my poor husband my husband is from South Dakota I'm from New York I'm I'm not passive aggressive I'm aggressive aggressive he's passive <laughs> passive so the lunch leads perfect us combination. to perfect combination we're driving in the car one day And I'm looking at yet another one of those round stickers on somebody's bumper that has a number on it. And I'm just flummoxed. I don't know what it means, but I'm sick of them. I've had it. And so I roll down my window and I yell out 38 double D, which is my bra size. 
<laughs> is driving and he gets that look on his face when he's trying to figure out what I've just done. <laughs> and then he does. And he turns it to me and he says, you don't know what those are, do you? I said, no, <laughs> I'm tired of them. And he said, those are the distances people have run in marathons. <laughs> I said, oh, and the, what we did was I built an essay about it, which we actually made a little video of um, that's on my website, because it's just so typical of marriage. If you're going to go the distance with someone, you're going to have times when he teaches you or she teaches you, you move each other along in this world mm -hmm. if you're very, very lucky yeah. and you, you propel one another and support one another. So his job, he has a permanent crook in his finger from putting it in my collar and pulling me back from doing things like this. <laughs> but that day I got the window down before he could get to me. And, you know, good for me. <laughs> Any response from the uh, other driver? Uh, no, I don't think, I think the other driver thought I was a crazy person and <laughs> that's fine. You know, that's good too. And I've read that piece aloud. I mean, I've read that piece to an audience and it's the most fun to read because it's very, I think it's about marriage really. And yeah. that's what I meant by the, that's what you mean by those small moments become illuminative of the big stuff of life. But here's the important thing that I heard you say was which is absolutely key in my experience, but I want to hear you talk a little bit about it. If you're paying attention. Yes. Right. So we'll, talk to me about, or talk to us, <laughs> talk to us about paying attention and what that, what that looks like as, you know, for the writer in particular. Yes. It begins with an eye. And there's, it's all, it's everywhere. You can't be looking down at your phone all day, people. You just can't. You have to be listening. You do have to be eavesdropping a little bit. You have to be looking up on the subway or as you're driving your car. You have to be willing, as I say, you have to be hospitable. That's what my phrase is. In other words, you have mm. to have a notebook on you at all times because the guy next to you, um, I watched somebody clipping someone's nose hair while he was driving. While <laughs> that's it we've hit <laughs> rock bottom as humanity i'm done you know oh and my again God. my husband was like you've got to calm down right that's but there's amazing a, oh no, that's she has totally a clipper and she's leaning and he's driving and i thought this is so wrong and i bet he's got hot coffee between his thighs too yeah. so you know yep. we're done but I, it was a you know you make a note and you say when you want to write that essay about we finally hit rock bottom, it's not something Donald Trump said. It's not this, it's not to make fun of, you know, because we keep hitting, reading that piece. Like this is the worst it can be. No, that's the worst it can be. <laughs> right. And so whatever it is, paying attention, writing it down, but paying attention too to the gestures of your family, to the uh, expressions of your family, to the small items of, of exchange that we have human to human, because they happen every day. You know, mm. we're not allowed to touch each other anymore. That's off the limits. But you're at, let's say you're at buying your, your kid her first pair of school shoes and you think you've got this and you've got your punch list that day. You're not going to get emotional. You got this to get done, right? And you're there. And then they, the, the person who's fitting her slips that little foot into that little shoe. And suddenly you're reaching in your purse to get your sunglasses on because you're crying. Mm -hmm. And that person who's selling those shoes just taps the back of your hand as if to say, I know mm -hmm. this is the mm -hmm. big stuff. Mm -hmm. Write it down when you get in the car, just write down shoe salesman tapping my hand and then think about it. Then think about it. What just happened here is the question. Yeah. Well, one person extended humanity itself to you with the tap of that hand. And that's beautiful. And that's what it I mean by indeed. paying attention. Small stuff. It's all in the small stuff. The yeah. big stuff, the weddings and wakes. And, you know, I don't I care know. about what you, I'm sorry, but I don't care about your eulogy. What I want to know is how did you get dressed for your father's funeral? How, mm -hmm. how, what did you power up to put up? What did you put on? Yeah. How did you get dressed for your spouses? You know, how did you show me that scene and you'll show me grief. Tell me what you read. Mm -hmm. I, it's out of context for me. I can't relate. But I can relate to how you got to the funeral if you had to put on that special bracelet or that, right? It's a mm -hmm. big difference. Yeah. God, that's good. That's so good. Uh, 
Uh, so let's go to the vomit draft. Um, <laughs> from you were going to get there one way or the other. <laughs> yes. Was. Well, it's a, you know, I've heard that term before, but I never really, I didn't really kind of start to, to, um, Oh, what's the word? I, I'm not, <laughs> I should have a, like a witty quip at this moment, but I don't. Um, so would you come rescue me um, in regards to what Absolutely. that, all the metaphors that that come from that? Because I think it's a really, it's not just like a, a, a passing phrase. I think it has a lot of like resonant meaning for us. I'm so glad you think so. I got it from my best friend who's a writer, who's a formidable science writer. I think he's the best science writer in America. His name is Gary Taubes. He taught it to me when we were kids. And mm -hmm. we were both kids living in two brownstones away from each other in New York City, both trying to be writers, walk in the city. You know, we didn't have a dime between the two of us. And one day he said something like, you know, you've just got to get a vomit draft of that book, Mary, when I was working on my first book. And I remember thinking, that's disgusting. And he was absolutely yeah, right. right. Because you can't love it. You can't be so sentimental about it that you can't change it. You have mm. to vomit up everything you know on this one topic, which is why I teach people that you have to have an argument for a memoir. Mm. And you do. You have to, what, what is this piece about is a really good place to stay, to start. Mm. Not that you're, you're going to get it right the first time, but then you're giving your subconscious this search mechanism, just a little tiny search term. So you don't get your whole life story, that you just get mercy or justice, or whatever you're interested in writing. So you vomit up everything you can think of from your from your whole life story on justice, or mercy, or forgiveness, or, but if you mm -hmm. just, if you try to vomit up everything from your whole life story, you know, it's not going to work. So the vomit draft gets everything up, like, oh, right, I had this experience with mercy, this is where I learned what it is, maybe the book you're writing is about showing mercy to your abuser. Well, we first need to know where you learned your definition of mercy. And mm. it was at a church. Was it at home? Did no one show mercy at home? So is this transcendent change to being merciful to your uncle who abused you, God forbid, is this coming from outside of your family of origin? Then, wow, wow, how'd you do that? We mm. want to see you get mm -hmm. it. So mercy, maybe you only saw mercy in movies or in Hallmark cards or in novels, right? We want that story. So the vomit draft allows you to search for one single term and throw up everything you know. It is supposed to be just like vomit, messy, stinky, and a big pile of sort of unintelligible stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful thing because if you write with perfection from the beginning, you will never finish. Yeah. You'll never get it done. Mm -hmm. So it cuts through. And I think the word is really appropriate. Andy Lamott calls it the shitty first draft, which I like, but it doesn't really work for me. Vomit mm. works for me. I get it. But vomit <laughs> with a purpose. We quote you on that. Vomit works for me. <laughs> vomit works for me. And it's so funny because people write to me and say vomit draft. And I'd, and I'd sometimes just get these two little e words in an email or thanks for the vomit draft. And I yeah. get it. It's very liberating. But it's also very practical. Yes. No. And it's um, it, what's powerful for me is that it's guttural and it's visceral. And yes. um, can you talk ab about the importance of viscerality in in writing? Well, in any kind of writing, but in, in memoir as as part of the sort of um, you know translation of bodily experience into language. Yeah, I think. Well, I think I love the language. I think I, what I like most about the vomit draft thing is it is almost offensive, right? You, you kind of. Mm -hmm. And you have a response to it. And yet, then it always sinks into people. So I think those visceral responses are some of our best material, but they need to be considered. What's behind it? What's the mm. pathology of mm -hmm. that visceral response? Is it, as an, is it an inheritance or is it a learned response? And I think that all of, of, of language allows us to kind of palpate back to figure out where did I get this thing, this visceral response, this grossed out response, or this falling in love response. Where'd you get that? Because you know, much of what we have is inherited, um, but we decorate it along the way. We, uh, we magnetize new things to it along the way. And that's where memoir lives best, is how'd you get there? Like, how'd mm -hmm. you get that idea? And how did it save your life when you did? Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, and here's the thing, who wants to clean up vomit is kind of like, the, that's sort of the editing stage, right? Right. right. And, and when you go to that level of viscerality in sort of bringing up the story, it's often uh, frightening. It's, it's terrifying. It's, it's harrowing because you have yes. to re-experience it, right? Right. And so I'm curious, um, I've had this experience a lot with clients in that they set off to write their memoir and they get to it and we get going and there's some momentum and they start getting into the elements of this viscerality and memory. And next thing you know, they're filing a divorce, they're moving to Timbuktu, right. they're they're sick, their kid is sick, there's there's you know, stuff comes up. And right. so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how to to pace the the inevitable uh, emotional impact of of writing your story of writing into memoir. I think it's a great question, and writing will have consequences. Writing memoir absolutely has consequences, and and people need to know what they are or need need to need to consider what they might be. And so I I do a lot of interviews of writers. I have a podcast called QWERTY. We've done a hundred episodes. And whenever I'm interviewing a memoir writer, I always ask that writer, what are we asking a memoir writer to do when we ask her to go back and read and look at a trauma? Are we asking her to relive it, reanimate it, look at it coolly from here, report on it? What are we asking them to do? And everybody has a different answer to that. And I think that it's right there that people get most frightened. I don't want to relive it, people will mm -hmm. say to me. And, and if it is trauma, if it is abuse, if it is, well, abuse will do in this context, I always say, please don't do this alone. Please, I hope you have a therapist. It's mm -hmm. so important that someone else carry with you the weight of this revelation. That, and I think it's a resistance. Now, there's so many reasons not to write that one is right up there with the hardest, but it shouldn't be the block. And the fact is, when you get your hands on your story, you get control of it, probably for the first time. So if you've been abused, God forbid, and I'm sorry if this triggers anyone, mm. you have not only lost the territory of your body, but you've also lost your voice because voice is a huge component. Someone told you not to tell. And so finding your voice is always part of a story of reclamation in, in abuse memoir. And I think that writing that, knowing that's going to be part of the experience, I'm not saying it's all going to be fine. I'm not saying you're going to change the ending, but you are going to get to choose when it does end. Now you get to choose the ending yourself. And mm -hmm. so the invitation is to have a look, learn a lot and choose how this thing comes out now because mm -hmm. you got told. So I think the visceral response may be one of terror. And I am a huge believer for better or for worse in counterphobia, writing from counterphobia, jump in, you ride the end of that, ride the tail of that dragon because you Okay, get... we define that for us. That so term, really, that's a fascinating term, counterphobia. Counterphobia for writers means if you're afraid of it, go there. If you're afraid of it, that's where the goods are. And so yeah. I've done it as a reporter going to blood spatter analysis school. I'm the most um, squeamish person I know. I pass out at blood tests. So to be at blood spatter analysis school where people are throwing. I think I'm going to have to title this episode <laughs> blood spatter analysis school. <laughs> I've referenced it a few times, but I found my best writing came from being terribly, terribly afraid. I was afraid of the experience. So I was getting sound, smell. Um, I was getting the viscosity of blood was it was was purposefully noticeable. It was I was seeing and feeling and hearing everything of mm. 25 or 50 or 100 or 600 percent because I was so afraid. Yeah. The first autopsy I went to ended garnered me my first essay for National Public Radio is All Things Considered, which got me a job mm. as a commentator there. It was called My mm. First Autopsy. And in my first autopsy, I had an experience that was a near occasion to faith. When I went from being terrified and with my back against the wall, as far away from the body as I could be, to after five and a half hours of this autopsy, standing over the body of a murdered man who had AIDS, full-blown AIDS, dead 10 days, still wearing the garret around his neck, to saying to the 
forensic pathologist, look, look at how the heart is harbored by the ribs. Look, and crying into the body and writing about that. So to walk in to the autopsy room almost killed me. To stay changed me. Mm. And that's where writing mm. is amazing. Shazam. Shazam, right? <laughs> Hear to that, put, people. To put my mother in a nursing home when I was 20 in, she was 56, was horrific. But when I got in the elevator to take the elevator down and left her there by myself, by the way, mm. they were playing. She's got dementia, right? She's got Alzheimer's disease. You know what was playing on the music? Memory from oh, Cats. No. And I wrote it down. No. The, yes. No. Because that's life. Yeah. And I just yeah. wrote it down in the car and it probably saved my life that day that I could say, that's insane. Yeah. That's so that's amazing. Insane. Yeah. That is so amazing. So that, but that's paying attention, yes. right? Like you could be so consumed in your grief that you don't even hear the song or it doesn't right. register, but to really be tuning into those quite literally Yes. Um, you know, not just the sounds, but that's where the goods are. So well, being and afraid. Yeah. Me metaphors everywhere. It is everywhere. You know, and, and we just have to really chart it and and trust our intuition. I think that's, that's we do. A, you, and we have a right. I mean, I, I, I don't I, I hesitate to use the word giving yourself permission because it sounds so subservient or something, but you do have to give yourself permission. You know, your the rest of your family is probably not writers. In my family, this was just de rigueur. You know, everyone was writing everything down. But um, that's not where most people come from. Right. And you're not going to get a lot of encouragement for this. And you're not going to get a lot of support. In fact, they may just think you're weird. Yeah. And that's okay. That's just fine. So keep your little notebook in your purse. I have one tied to the dashboard of my car. There's one next to my bed. There's in the bathroom. It's in the kitchen. It's everywhere. And I write things down. And then every once in a while, I take them all and I transcribe them into a, a big file on my computer and I use them. But you may not get a lot of support for this. You can do it quietly, but it's really important to write it down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you talk briefly about the importance of the phrases? There's two of them here. Uh, the way I remember it, mm. quote unquote, and... I imagined us dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I think those are important phrases and I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Yes. The why? way I remember it is- Like, I want to hear you tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a sister and she's older and she's a writer. And we were at a dinner party not long ago where I told a story and everybody laughed and she waited till the laughter died down. And then she said, that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> and yeah. I love that. And the first yeah. hundred times it happened, I didn't love it so much. I was right. just flummoxed by the fact that she was denying my truth. What was she doing? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we've differed for years. She doesn't like my first book. She, well, she didn't read my first book. She didn't like our mother. So they didn't get along in the same way. They had mm. a complicated relationship. So mm. she has every right to feel the way she does. But why she doesn't remember the story I told is because it didn't happen to her that way. Mm -hmm. And that's what you get to say as a memoir writer. And I recommend people practice this phrase. You're right. And then fill in the blank. In my case, it's Margaret. You're right, Margaret. That's not the way it happened to you. To you. That's the way yeah. it happened to me. Because family is a pizza and everybody gets a slice. <laughs> but once you take family your slice, you cannot recreate the pizza. <laughs> and the pizza could be Christmas 1995 or the day you buried your mom. Nobody had the same day the day you buried your mom. Nobody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't ask it of others. Don't expect it of others. And don't get angry. Mm -hmm. Write your truth. So the mm -hmm. way I remember it is specific to you. And then I imagined us is about what did you think was going to happen, right? What, what I imagined us going in this direction. I imagined us this way. Those are, that's, that's saying that that isn't what I know to be true. But I imagined that this is what happened next. Right. The same way when I write dialogue, I say the conversation went something like this, because when I was eight, I wasn't carrying a notebook. And, you know, crazy as my family was for notebooks, I don't I wasn't taking notes when my parents told us that they weren't going to stay together or whatever those traumatic moments are. 
But I do remember who was crying, who was screaming, and who was begging because we have prescribed mm -hmm. roles in families. So mm -hmm. you can write from that point of view. You can recreate that dialogue because if you were the crying one, you remember that. And if your mother was screaming and your father was begging, whatever it was, just never change the intent of the exchange and say, I imagined us doing what the, the way it occurred, the, the way I think it happened or the, the conversation went something like this is what I, as I said, I always say. Um, so claiming something to be true when you're not sure is not okay, yeah. but absolutely holding by your version is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote about driving off the Golden Gate Bridge and yeah. into the Pacific. Did I didn't do that really? No, I didn't. But I imagined that like the grief was so the, so, such that that I could in, envision and imagine that and I think that does in your experience does that open up a whole like another realm of possibility in memoir I think so I think it does I mean and I think that you know we all we have to be careful because the French have a wonderful word for it about the words up the staircase is the way it translates which is what we wish we had said when he dumped you right mm -hmm. but none of us the humanity, the reality of humanity is that none of us is ever clever when we get dumped. Perfect, none of us right, is ever right. clever with our snotty sister-in-law or our, you know, the, the, the cab driver in New York. None of us is ever clever in the moment. We get out of the cab and we say, God, I wish I had said this. Yeah, so yeah. we want to be really, really, when we write memoir, we never want to make ourselves more clever or witty than we actually are. We share our humanity when we say, God, I wish I had done that. And so there is a wonderful place to write from. It has to do with what happened after you regathered your thoughts and all that. Um, and there's a wonderful place to write from when we imagine ourselves doing things. Absolutely. But we want to make sure that when we report what we said when he dumped us, we don't have the hand on the hip, sex in the city retort, because right. nobody has that. <laughs> right. right. But the, the interesting thing is, I wish I had said that and then you're basically sharing your internal thought that is pretty brilliant. And so you get to kind of claim that anyway as an author. You still get to make yeah. the reader laugh or cry yeah. and you still get to show them your soul. What mm -hmm. I wanted to say to him was X, you know, yeah. I have something, I think it's in the, um, I think it's in my first book. Yes. It's in my first book. I had a boyfriend break up with me in my twenties because he said, I can't marry you because I think you'll get what you, I'm afraid you'll get what your mother has. I mean, wow. maybe wow. the rottenest thing that anyone has wow. ever said to me. Yeah. And which, what I wish I had said was, well, I can't marry you because our children will have a fat ass, but I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. But it shows you my character that that's what I wish that yeah. you didn't devastate me with it at the time. I just thought, well, you're the worst person I've ever met. And now that I know who you are, of course, I would never marry you. Right. But I wish I had said that <laughs> yeah. so much. <laughs> oh, my God, this is so great. Okay. Um, um, oh, yes. The, one of my favorite um, parts of the book, one of the favorite anecdotes, which I think is based on a, a piece that you wrote, um, is about the um, the ice cream. You know, just sort of just you're you're talking about ice cream. I think it, it was in the the context was something about coming up with topics to write about and how they turn in to extreme from sort of the banality of something that everyone does into like the extreme emotional power of your personal experience. And yes. in this case, um, a pretty harrowing family secret. So I don't know. If, I mean, you've written yeah. about it, so you oh, must no, be okay talking about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And how kind of you to ask. It, it's a, it reveals several things. This exchange, I was home, I was 22. My mother was just in early Alzheimer's and, uh, but she was still working and the phone rang. And it was a woman telling me that somebody's son had just died. A friend of the family's son had just died. And I didn't think anything of it. And, but she said, call your mother and tell her. So I called my mother. And she was a teacher at the time, even though she was just starting with her, her memory loss, but she was at, uh, on the playground. And, and um, I said to her, so-and-so's uh, son has just died. And she said, how long have you known? And I said, a minute, why? And then she said, no, how long have you known? 
And for the first time in my whole life, I realized, oh my God, she's been sleeping with so-and-so. Not my father, but oh my God. And I got off the phone with her and I called my sister and I said, oh, mom's happy, mom's happy in the corner. And she said, how long have you known? And I said, what is this? The question of the day? <laughs> I said, how long have you known? And she said, since I was nine. Oh my God. And Phew. then I, when I asked her, when I was writing that book, I was at, I said to her, what's your version of that when you found out? And because at that time we couldn't really get into it because my mother was losing her mind and my sister, you know, but later when I said to her, if I asked you to write about it, what would you say? And she told, she wrote down this story, came back in like an hour and a half. She just pounded it out of her just, well, she was nine years old and she wanted a good humor ice cream and the truck was coming and she went into our mother's wallet and she found a picture of our best friend and she was silenced from that day. And I never understood growing up why she got quiet. Mm. She stopped being fun. Mm. She hated our mother mm. and she was so defensive. And mm. yet when our mother got sick, she flew home, quit her job, flew home and took care of our mother because she could bathe, feed and dress her. Whereas every time I tried, I just fell apart completely. Wow. So it's a whole story of the two versions of living with this one woman and what we can do for one another. So mm. yeah, the ice cream story is pretty, imagine my feeling when I read it for the first time, just amazed me. Completely. No idea. So beautiful, so beautiful. Thank you. Um, okay, we're, we have a little bit more time left. I have a couple, couple more questions. Um, well, I think you've talked about turning fear into revelation. Mm. Yeah, you've talked about that with the, um, with the cadaver experience. Um, I think that's just, that's, that's important. That takes a lot of courage, you know? I mean, in the same way that um, sitting with ourselves takes courage. Yeah. You know, I, always, I always talk about that, like with, um, they're not that much different writing and meditation, like to right. sit and be quiet with yourself. For most, I would argue with most people is a terrifying proposition. And many people can't do it. They have such a hard time yeah. finding the the discipline around meditation but it's and the same thing is with the discipline around writing but what it is is the in my experience is the confrontation and i'm curious if that's your experience too you know what do you think about confrontation when it comes to i love that writing? word um right. and i love and I, I love that word a lot i think that's an interesting way to look at it and i think also i don't want to mislead people that it's only in those big moments, like going to see an open body that you, that you learn the fear is everywhere. The fear of failure is everywhere. Mm -hmm. I write best when I think, when I realize I'm writing from a place of fear. So for instance, the thing I've feared most in my life, the thing that caused me the most amount of sturm and drang in my life, of course, was parenting. And mm -hmm. you, you don't learn anything by being right. When you're a parent, everything you, every time you've had a moment that moves you forward is because you did, you did it wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And those moments are when you have a child. And I love that. So I was writing from uh, as a parenting columnist early in my child's life. And that really was the highest, highest stake. So you don't have to go into an autopsy room to be a writer. You can just try parenting a child, raising a dog, being mm -hmm. married. I mean, the stakes yeah. are so high. Mm -hmm. So please don't mistake what I said, anybody. It's, it's the fear is always there. And the confrontation of that fear it's like, I call it hitting it with a hammer, hit it with mm -hmm. a hammer, see what's in there. Did you yeah. inherit these feelings from your mother? Did you inherit them? Did she inherit them from her mother? How far back does this crazy idea go that mm. you have to do X or you can't do Y? And whoever taught you that writing has no value, by the way, because it has enormous value because you confront these things. So I do believe that it's a confrontation with your beliefs every single day. And that's where the mm. goods lie. What do you yeah. really think about God? What do you really think about caregiving? Did you really want to do, or, you know, or did you just do it because that's what you always do in your family, right? So confrontation is a great word. Mm. Well, I could have picked like a million brilliant quotes from your book, but one of my favorites was writing memoir is the single greatest portal to self-awareness. Yeah. And really we've already is. talked a little bit about that, but um, I don't know if you want to, 
riff on that a little bit, but I, I, I was thinking about it in the context of the section you have about Me Too and mm -hmm. confronting um, trauma and, um, oh yeah, and particularly that quote from um, Paula Jean Ham, mm -hmm. who has LPC behind her name, which yeah, I don't- she's a licensed practice. She's a therapist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a, just an, a really important and beautiful quote on page 69. I don't know mm -hmm. if you have your book in front of you, but. Usually, um, um, but no, but why don't you read it? Because then I'm. Okay. So, <laughs> I wasn't giving it to somebody. <laughs> I, I ideally want your your voice, but yep. here we are. Um, yeah, page, this is page 69. Um, Paula was very helpful. I had I had had all these students that had been through me too, and and my my inbox filled up when just for a little background, my inbox literally filled up with people saying I've never written my story. I want to tell my story. It's been thirty eight years since my abuse. When Harvey Weinstein first was exposed, my inbox just mm -hmm. went with yeah. stories. When the Kavanaugh hearings happened, as you remember that kind of chronology, everything went quiet. And yeah. I have received only maybe two abuse stories since. And that has broken my heart yeah. because there was a brief period where everybody was ready to talk. So mm. I noticed a lot of similarity in the stories. And I called Paula Ham, who's a friend, and asked her to explain what I was experiencing. And beautiful. Here's what she said on the evolution of what I thought I saw. Quote, when there are traumas happening, we don't have the language for it. In order for the self to heal, you have to be able to put language to it. When you speak the unspoken, you metabolize. Having language for the trauma we've experienced contributes to the cohesive sense of self. Yes. Wow. I know. Wow. This is why you call people. If you don't know what you're thinking, call somebody, right? Yeah, that's right. You do some reporting. You know, if you if you want to write a scene in your fiction about a woman who runs a flower shop, go down and hang out with her for a couple of days. I mean, yes. I've never had anybody say no to me ever when mm. I've asked them if I can hang out and watch what they do. So Paula was so generous with that, but she gave language to me to explain to me what it was I was witnessing, which was people were changing as they wrote. Mm -hmm. And it was so wonderful. And so I believe that I don't know how I feel about anything until I write it down yeah. because we talk in this ridiculous way. Oh, I went to this great restaurant last night. It was like, so great. It's like, so great. You've just got to go. What did you learn? Nothing, right? <laughs> Nothing. You don't even know if it's French or Italian or what. Mm -hmm. And so when we write it down, we're giving ourselves the chance to dip into the subconscious, the unconscious, the pathological, the history, the inherited, the, the new, the dazzling, the, everything we've seen felt it's all annotation it's all in there and the thing is to get the dipper to go down in and annotate and say wow mm. is that what i think mm. and i love it i love it so yes it's very much like meditation the way meditation brings things together and snaps them together that way beautiful well let's close with a little poignancy okay um i <laughs> I tend to have, as a writer, and I don't know if this is true for any of you listeners out there, but when it comes to big events like 9-11, for example, I just, like, I, you know, there's so, such a rush for all the experts to comment and to write and to talk about it that I have a really hard time, you know, finding words. Yeah. And I just, I, I found it so beautiful and so poignant um, what you wrote well, in relationship to your father and that, that anecdote and that story about your father and uh, around 9-11. And I'm wondering if you can share that, that story of what oh, he did. Oh, that's so lovely. Yeah. So my dad was a sports writer. And when he retired as a sports writer, he went to work in the World Trade Center, working for the New York State Racing and Wagering Commission, answering questions. Basically, he was 70 years old and he was just answering their mail because people write in and ask all kinds of things about New York State, he, mostly horse racing. And one day, a little girl from Devonia Avenue in the Bronx wrote in, and she wanted the turtle racing rules. And Love it. It, she wrote, to, so she wrote to the right guy, because he had a, the time of his life 
riding back and making up the New York State turtle racing rules for her. And when 9-11 happened, when, and those of us who were um, contributors to NCPR and to NPR, we were asked, you know, what do you got? What, what have you got? I mean, like in the, literally the day after, what have you got? And then the week after. And I, and I digitally raised my hand and said, I have a story about the World Trade Center. When my dad first worked there, he used to lie on the floor and watch the way the, the building swayed because he was on the 101st floor. And then one day when he was up there, he got this letter from this little girl asking for the turtle racing rules for New York State. And I read the letter aloud mm. on NPR. And my editor said, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting us remember what those buildings were what they produced and letting us just have them back for that moment. So it was an incredibly kind thing of them to run it, but I was so glad I'd saved the letter. I kept it on my desk for years. And, and that's how we bring back ourselves back with writing. Yeah. We yeah. show each other our humanity and we bond. So that's why that is it. the perfect place to end. And I, and for people who want to read the letter, you can, you it's can find there. it here in um, The Memoir Project, a thoroughly non-standardized text for writing and life. A beautiful, beautiful book and an Thank important you. one. And um, Marian Roach Smith, I, this is just awesome. This is like <laughs> the best. I really had so much fun speaking with you. And uh, I think our listeners are gonna just, whoop, they're just gonna wake right up to writing their beautiful memoirs. Uh, do you have anything uh, coming up or anything that you wanna share um, that would help people in their writing journey? Well, I'm always teaching at the Memoir Project, which is at marionroach.com and the classes begin all the time. And as I said before, the, maybe the greatest offering I can and ask, just remind people is to get that writing life, learn how to write everything, learn how to write the personal essay, the op-ed, the, the book length, but don't just spend all your time writing that book length because you can attract an agent with a well-placed op-ed. My students learn them and publish them all the time. And the result is many of them have gotten agents and editors. It's a way to test your material on the public. And I really just encourage everyone to have the writing life because as you and I have just discussed for an hour, it's the best. It is indeed. Well, thank you so, so much for thank sharing you. your wisdom and experience with us today and a, a total joy to be with you. For me too. Thank you so much. And thank you again for all you do. You bring such peace and goodness with, with your message of getting in our heads. Thank you.